This is Life Elsewhere, created and hosted by Norman B. Hello, welcome to Life Elsewhere. I'm Norman B. We're going to look at the time in America when the president and his family were the objects of rumors, legends, and conspiracy theories. Unprecedented in US politics, outbreaks of hate for that man have occurred in every national election cycle since 2004 and continue to the present day, two elections after his presidency ended. Folklorist and scholar Patricia Turner explains how these hateful thought patterns have grown even more vitriolic and persistent and what that means for American political culture. Miss Turner's book is Trash Talk, Anti-Obama Law and Race in the 21st Century. Later in the show, famed caricaturist Steve Brodner will give us a political cartoonist view of Obama, along with his unabashed opinion of the 45th president. First, my guest is Patricia Turner. She is a professor of African-American studies of world arts and culture and dance. Gosh, I'd love to be a a professor of culture and dance. That sounds so fabulous. Her new book is, uh, well, we're going to get into this and, and, and tell you why I enjoyed it so much. The title is Trash Talk, Anti-Obama Law and Race in the 21st Century. Patricia, welcome to Life Elsewhere. It's nice to be with Life Elsewhere. Well, thank you. Um, as I'm, I'm just going to make a little sort of uh, go off tangent here for a moment. I would love, as I said, to be a professor of culture and dance. That just sounds so fabulous. I, I love it. I leave it to my colleagues. I do the culture part, and I work with some fabulous choreographers ah, okay. who do the dance part. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And and we, we work together so students have a kind of integrated experience. Well, gotcha. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this book, which... I I have to tell you, in some respects, this was a sad book to read. And and I I think you're going to understand what I mean when I say that. But on the other hand, it was illuminating, enlightening. It was eye-opening. And I would go as far as saying that every high school should have this book in their library. I just think that that would be wonderful, except, and I see you sort of partly laughing there, is that we're in a we're in a world right now where libraries in schools or libraries in general seem to not want to talk about things that that both you and I think are so important. Any, yeah, any I mean, yeah. At, at, at the risk of sounding um, um, snide, I would say that in some parts of the country, there'd be more interest in getting a literal weapon into the hands of a school librarian than yes. a book yes. like mine, which is a more metaphoric uh, yeah. way of uh, of of uh, enabling and empowering students and yes. librarians to sort of understand contemporary culture. Well, the title of your book, Patricia, kind of tells us what it's all about, except I want to go into it. I want to get into the into the real details of it. But I'm going to repeat the title again for my listeners so they re- can really grasp it. Trash Talk, Anti-Obama Law and Race in the 21st Century. I I think I might be right, and I want to know if you agree with me, that your book is coming out at the perfect time, because after, and I, and I have a hard time with finding the right adjective to describe the last four or five years, uh, it, it does seem to me that we have collectively forgotten about how Obama was treated. Um, The Obama family, in fact, it seems to me, I don't think we've completely forgotten, but I think we've kind of, there have been so much distractions going on in the last four to five years. And and specifically right now, what is going on with the big lie? And I don't have to go through the whole rigmarole. But I just want to ask you, Patricia, were, were you aware of when this book was coming out in September of 2022, just how important it is that we don't forget 
the issues around racism and Obama? I think a, a, a key moment for me in the trajectory of the book I thought, like any author, you know, you sort of have an endpoint, right? And I had to keep moving that endpoint because I didn't anticipate the election of Donald Trump, and I probably should have. But my thought initially on an endpoint was at the end of the second Obama administration. I hadn't anticipated a president that would continue to run against a former president and continue to disseminate misinformation uh, ab about that individual in order to keep his own base um, excited about, about him as a, a candidate. And I then didn't anticipate the transfer of power issues that surfaced when Biden was elected. Uh, and and then I, th I think it really, the, the, the timing of the publication of the book came home to me really around the events of January 6th, when there are um, new conspiracy theories alleging that Barack Obama had set up Dominion voting machines back in 2016 to be manipulated by an Italian satellite. Um, that's one of the conspiracy theories that then President Trump had Mark Meadows and his team investigate the accusations of that got hundreds of thousands of hits online. There were YouTube videos and you couldn't keep up with the counter. Um, many of them have since been been taken, taken, taken down. But at that juncture, I realized that for the next, as long as 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 Donald Trump was a player uh, in, in politics, you had to be aware of him around election times. Yeah. So September, you know, we've got a midterm election coming up. I'm hoping that perhaps people will have an under will be able to find those portions of the book that talk about um, perhaps what um, political supporters and advocates for democracy, what what they might be thinking about in terms of how to position their candidates. Yes, so well put. In the epilogue, which sort of ties in with exactly what you're just talking about, on the very last page of your epilogue, you're talking about uh, a Gallup poll that Trump loved uh, because it was about, it was really about, I can't think it was about personality or the most popular person, I think, something like that. It doesn't yeah. really matter in that. But Trump comes out on top and, and, and Biden doesn't. And so Trump then pontificates on how really how wonderful he is that everybody really likes him and they don't like Biden. And it's just it just after reading your book with some so so many shocking things in here, so many things you just want to go, oh God. <laughs> and then you get to this and you go, this is just crazy stuff. This is just so absurdist. I'd just like to get your take, Patricia, in writing the book, because you I want to get into this in a minute, but you, you went to great trouble, great detail to get so much research. But then you get right to the very end, you do your epilogue and, and you've got this, you, you're still having to deal with this sort of monstrous craziness. But, but there's a caveat here because at the very end, you say it is my hope that by knowing and understanding and talk, taking seriously the trash talk, we can move forward in productive ways. As Barack Obama says, Yes, we can. And that, I think, was absolutely perfect. What a perfect ending to this wonderful book. I want to go back now. I'm sorry. <laughs> we went to the back of your I, book. I, I, I'm not going to interrupt anyone praising my work. So. <laughs> but let's go back to the very beginning of the book. As I just said, the work that you put into this, it, it, it's, I've got to tell you, it's an easy read. I, I, I Sometimes academic books kind of get a little sort of stodgy. This is a very easy read. You know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about just putting, just collating all the information and doing all the research. Sure. Um, one of the things that, um, that so, so the book really starts uh, in, in 2004. And I think most of my readers of a certain age, I have to remember that my students don't fall into this category anymore, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. my readers of a certain age will remember 
Barack Obama's emergence on the public scene that evening when he nominated John Kerry for the Democratic uh, uh, presidential position uh, uh, in, in 2004. And I remember watching that and as a student of rumors, legends, and conspiracy theories about race. At that point, I'd already written two books about that and one book on anti-Black stereotypes. So I was watching that speech from a position, an informed position about how trash talk develops and what the triggers are. And I remember sort of leaning back and saying, boy, if this guy's for real, he's going to be a magnet for it. And then I started to collect and my, my students and my colleagues began to send me down the paths that would take me. And then if you think about the difference between 2004 um, and, and, and the trajectory of the next 16 or so years, we get the emergence of Twitter. We get the emergence of, of Instagram. More and more people are on Facebook. There's a kind of democratization of social media, a way in which any voice can be amplified during that period of time. And there's some very positive consequences of that. And there's some very negative consequences of that. And part of you're asking a little bit about my research technique. I had to go into the more negative. I had to spend my time where the trash was being talked. And, and one of the things that you know, one of the takeaways from that epilogue that you read is I actually think that the people who support political candidates, the people who report on political candidates, the journalists as well, they need to spend time where the trash is. Because I was there with the trash talkers, but there wasn't a lot of attention, particularly to some of the, the, the texts that I illuminate in the book, um, there wasn't a lot of attention to them in, in you know, what's now called the mainstream media. And, the, um, and I'm not sure that, that the people supporting Hillary Clinton or supporting other Democrats really took the time to understand what kinds of conversations were being had um, by the far right in these increasingly available zones of the internet. And I'll add on to that, that I don't know that there was an awareness that people were starting to capitalize on that, yes. that this became a revenue stream, um, mobilizing the far right, telling telling your audience that you needed money to go to Hawaii to investigate Barack Obama's birth certificate and putting 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 a, a, a button on your website and collecting hundreds of thousands of dollars from innocent people who wanted to fuel your efforts. I don't think that there was enough of an awareness that that was going on. Totally agree with you. Absolutely. God, you said so many important things there. There's a couple of things I want to pick up on. One is social media. And, and that is, as you said, back in the day in, in 2004, social media wasn't the way it is now. And the right definitely took it. They embraced it and certainly knew how to use it. What shocked me in reading your book is that Racism has always been there. It, it's not just in America. It's it's everywhere. Racism is one of those things, unfortunately, that we have as I guess as humans, we, we have this fear of the other. And I think we have to be honest about that. But then it changed in America with the right, as you explain in the book, just going almost not, not almost, absolutely bonkers over something which was completely absurd. I mean, just absurdist stuff, but believed by legions of people, which makes me wonder whether that racism that's already there is just waiting to be stirred up by a figure like Trump, by these extreme people on the right. Did it really take those people to, to, to sort of in, to light the flame? Just get your take on that. Yeah, I think that for a segment of the population that's disaffected 
that's dissatisfied with their own trajectory. You know, the, the, the standard mantra about the American dream, people who feel like it won't be the case that my children have a better life. You know, the, the classic sort of definition of the American dream is that each generation will successively have a better experience than the one before. If you're, if you're saying, no, actually, the way I read the economy, the way I read the political sphere, my children will not advance forward, then you're waiting for explanations. Yes. Uh, and you're waiting for some way of um, um, someone or some positions to blame for that. And savvy people know how to tap into that and to provide the scapegoat, to provide uh, an easy answer. And so it starts pretty subtly. You know, the first um the first rumors I talk about in my book are the ones that Barack Obama won't wear a flag pin yes. and he won't salute the flag. Uh, and these very sort of things that you can imagine people saying, oh, only someone um, on the fringe would believe something like that. But they go unchecked and we get from he won't wear a flag pin in 2007 to 2014. Well, He's sending American soldiers into Ebola affected regions of Africa so that they will contract the disease, move back to the United States and spread it throughout the country so that um, he can replace Americans with Muslims. That's always been his plan. So from seven years, you go to he won't wear a flag pin to yes. this maniacal genocidal vision. Um, and yes. Well, you know, Patricia, I just would like to say that when I was talking about the right time for this book, I think it's things like that. Obama not wearing the flag pin or the tan suit. Remember when he wore a tan suit? That was just like, <laughs> it was so outrageous. Or, or uh, Michelle showing her, her arms, her beautiful arms. At some kind of event, I can't, maybe it was the inauguration ball or something. I can't remember, but but there's so many of these different things along the way that you illustrate in your book so effectively. That's the part I think makes your book so so terrific, a, a terrific read, is that you remind us of all these different things along the way. But now looking back, gosh, how horrible! How just how. I mean, how horrendous it was and how damaging it was to all of us. Yeah. That's what just really struck me about reading Trash Talk. Let me just remind my listeners, I'm talking to Patricia A. Turner. Her book is called Trash Talk, Anti-Obama Law and Race in the 21st Century. Such a good read. It's, it's not heavy going. As I said, you've got a wonderful style of writing, so that it makes, a, a, I think, a, a, a nice, comfortable read. But Page after page, you're saying things like, oh, I know, I just want to, you know. Um, for you, for the author, uh, were there points in writing the book when you said to yourself, oh, my God, I'm just getting sort of overwhelmed by this? Did, did it, I'm just wondering about some of the emotions for you, Patricia. You know, I think, um, as, as I said before, um, I guess I'm sort of fortunate in that, um, this wasn't my first book. Yeah. This wasn't my first time delving into how toxic um, discourse can become about an individual and and about a movement. So I've got I've got a pretty thick skin when it comes to to to, to that. I will say that as an African American woman. Much of the material about Michelle Obama was more potentially fraught for me because her trajectory is very similar to mine. Mm -hmm. um, we both come from hardworking parents who did not have higher education, who aspired that for their daughters. We both went, we, she, you know, she went, um, she, she has a very urban background and I have a very rural background, but we, we, I didn't go to Princeton as an undergrad, but I went to graduate school at Berkeley, which when I went there was the number one graduate program um, 
uh, in the United States. So we both had access to these elite educations. We both were accused of being there inappropriately um, as affirmative action babies, the, the, the notion that we could actually write well enough, speak well enough to hold our own in those environments was questioned. What Michelle endured that that I did not have to endure, um, this is a, a radio broadcast, I should, should tell your listeners, I'm a very fair-skinned African-American woman. So many of the things that Michelle had to deal with, with being compared to an ape, and actually being accused of being transsexual. Um, one of the most prominent of the texts about her alleged that um, she was born a man and had a sex change operation during uh, her college years, that Barack is gay, that this was a um, bizarre marriage of, of convenience for his political, political agenda. The daughters are adopted. And again, these stories and the videos about them and the pictures that supposedly illustrate that Michelle has a penis, these got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hits. These get circulated over and over again. You can still find evidence if Michelle speaks out publicly now. You'll very often find after the article about that, that message, these co comments on this story have been deleted. Yes. And it is usually because the naysayers have jumped on there and said things like, why are you calling her Michelle? Her given name is Michael. Uh, so those, those, the ones, the ones about Michelle got under my skin in a way a little bit more than the ones about Barack. And I, you know, I think for, for fairly obvious reasons. You know, I, I don't know if this sounds really odd, but it got under my skin as well in reading your book. Yeah. Even at the time, I remember when some of those rumors were going around and all that horrible stuff. I used to think to myself, I still don't think to myself, this is what, how would anybody come? To, I mean, how would you go in that direction? Let me ask you this. And I, and this is one of those questions where I'm kind of hesitant to say it in the form that I'm going to say it. But as a woman of color, as an African-American woman, did you, did you, did you expect that there would be the kind of sort of racism that you you that you talk about the trash talk that you talk about in trash talk was that something was was almost predictive for you did you did you did yeah. you yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i mean i think i think one of the things that i was very aware of and i and my 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 colleagues who study race in in america i'm not unique in this yeah i think we're all very wary of all of the language around a post-racial america yes. that accompanied the election and inauguration of barack obama the 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 notion that suddenly we were going to be able to put america's past racism behind us and that this signaled that the country was um um, in the best possible place in terms of race. Uh, I, we all knew that that wasn't the case because it's happened so many times before historically. People said the same thing after the Civil War. The Civil War was actually supposed to be, well, you see, we're going to go from having an enslaved population to a free population yeah. and race will not figure into this. Yes. Um, we um, and so then we have the backlash and the emergence of Jim Crow and lynching and all that comes in those last three decades of the 19th century. Then World War One comes along and there's this implicit promise or explicit promise made to African-Americans. Well, if you go to war, if you if you respond to the draft, if you enlist and you comport yourself heroically in the war, when you come back from the war, all of the Jim Crow racism will be put aside. People will welcome you on equal terms and and all will be right with the world. Well, yeah. when the soldiers came back from World War One and World War Two as well, there were often white gangs that met them at the train stations in the South and ripped their uniforms off of them, uh, and 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 de de weaponized them and so forth. It happens again after World War Two. The same message goes out. This is this is this is modern America has no room for racism after you know the Second World War. 
same repeat civil rights movement. So, so if you've studied, if you've studied African Americans in the United States, you've seen this cycle before. And it doesn't mean that African Americans have not made progress. I would not want to swap where I am. Right. Yeah. Anyone from any of those other eras, because I did get a fabulous education and I am in a position where um, I can write and get books published. Yes. So obviously there's been progress, but the ability of those who want to manipulate disaffected America's Americans and turn turn race as the key point and say your your children are not doing better than your generation because black people are taking everything because black yes. people um, are are taking their slots in the colleges because black people are taking the jobs that uh, that you want for them. Um, I knew the election of Barack Obama was not going to mitigate that. I want to let my listeners know that everything that you've just said, you've explained so well in Trash Talk, which is another reason why this is such a good book. This next question is, I, I just bear with me as I ask this question, then, Patricia. <laughs> so the African-American icons, OJ, Kanye, Obama, how are they viewed in the African American centric world? Is 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 it different? Do we do we see a completely different understanding of who is an icon if you're African American as opposed to myself who's a Caucasian? Yeah, um, I think it's I think it's complicated because there's no there's no broad spread consensus within the African-American community. Right. We don't all get together and go, let's let's position this guy as a good guy, this guy not so much. Uh, and so I, I think there's some gen some generalizations that can be made. I think I think there was an enormous amount of pride in Barack Obama crisscrossing, you know, African Americans. Um, but but certainly not entirely. There were people who thought he wasn't optimizing the opportunity he had as president ah. to do even more. If you think about um, Cornell West and Tavis Smiley yes. as sort of exemplars of the he's 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 not black enough sort of sort of uh, yes. positioning, um, and he's not as sufficiently uh, attentive to race. I mean, one of the and um, um, OJ. Um, you know, to, to, to use one of your examples, yeah. you know, there were people who all black people who always thought he was guilty. There were black people who always thought he was innocent. There were black people who always thought he was guilty, but they didn't like <laughs> having to say that publicly. Yeah. And they didn't yes. like the OJ test or the Louis Farrakhan test was the other one. When I wrote my first right. one, um, interviewers used to always ask me to defend Louis Farrakhan. Um, and, uh, and so it was, um, you know, there, there is within our community and as I understand it in the Caucasian community as well. Yes. yes. Well, you know, you know, I just want to stop you there for a moment because I, I always, and I still do get the feeling that the Caucasian community was so infused. Well, a big part of the, of the Caucasian community was so infused about, the presidency of Obama. Just a personal Absolutely. story here, and I've I've mentioned this on the program before. On the day of the inauguration, I I Obama's inauguration, I don't know whether it was a free day for for children at school, but all I remember is I sat in front of the television with my then young son, who's now twenty, and he sat on my lap as we watched the inauguration, and he turned to me and he said, "Dad, are you crying?" And I and I was. I had tears rolling down my my face, my cheeks, and I thought because I thought this was such an amazing moment. I just was moved. I was moved to tears by this incredible moment. Moment. And and I think I make the case in the book that 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 is a big part of why the venom against Obama was so so potent. Because it's not just that the far right hated the Obamas. They hated that other white people loved them. You were as much a part of the problem for 
people of a very different thought. Like what, what, what is the magnetism that someone is seeing? What, how can a white person be moved? Don't they understand that it should be a white man up there taking yes. the oath of office in the United States? You know, going back to what I said earlier about the 2004 Democratic Convention, if you remember that moment when the Obama Obama's on the stage yes. and all of those people are in the audience and they're waving signs that say Obama and it's red, white and blue and the balloons are cascading yes. down and there's euphoria in a largely white audience after a speech by a black man, half Kansan, half Kenyan black man. What the far right saw was what what is wrong with those people? Why are they falling all over themselves for someone with an, his middle name is Hussein? What's wrong with them, with these people? And I think the venom is in part because there's so much enthusiasm on the part because he was accepted uh, by by large swaths of of the population. You know, Patricia, there is so much we can go into and talk about your book. One of the things that, that struck me as I as I carefully read your book is that here we are today in 2022. And it seems that, and I don't know, maybe I'm just jumping ahead here, but it does seem to me that in some respects, racism in America has gotten much worse. Or it's maybe it hasn't gotten worse so much as it's it's more out in the open it's not shielded as much as it used to be i know that i think you agree with me on that having said that are we going through just a a sort of an evolution right now in your understanding are we going through a a time where we sort of need to sort of clear i don't know sort of cough up the phlegm so to speak and just get it out of our system um i like that metaphor i'm going to remember that one Um, (laughs) (laughs) um If history tells us anything, it is that um, we're going to go through this for a while. And I don't have any kind of a crystal ball to tell me for how long. You know, a lot's going to depend on the next couple of election cycles to be sure what happens. Um, And then then there will be, you know, we'll start to move in a more what you and I would say is a more positive direction. Um, I don't know what the next signal of that will be, if it'll be uh, another individual like Barack Obama or a movement or something, but yes. things will you know, look positive and, and we'll be moving in, 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 a, in a good way. And then unfortunately it's, it swings back again. You know, that's yes. just the, the way, the way, the, the way it has, um manifest for a couple of hundred years and i don't really see a way of breaking that cycle yes you know in some respects so well, actually in a lot of respects yes. i would like to take trump out of the equation because for me trump represents nothing but you know is is, is the ultimate flim flam man it's a con man it's it's you know, um but having said that there are other people, not necessarily in his sphere, but there are other people on the right that really are embracing this sort of move towards just very, very unpleasant racism. And, and I, I wonder whether those people are, are it, it, because Trump, we know it's just it's, it's purely about money. It's purely about just whatever it is. It's it's it's. it's, it's it's not really about politics, but in these other people, and uh, we could go through a list of names. Yeah. What is the reasoning for them? Is it just pure, unadulterated, I hate people of color? Or is it more than that? Is there some other sort of urgency there for, for, for them? Um, I think a lot of it is I love myself and people yeah. like me. Yes. You know, when you think of the Ted Cruz's and the yes. Mike Pence's and the Ron DeSantis's is their own self-worth and their own sense of entitlement to all of the sport, you know, Dick Cheney, you know, that that, that sense of entitlement to yes. really whatever they covet, whatever they want, and their notion um, that if you 
you, it, 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 it's up to each individual to figure out how to get what right. they aspire to. And there should be no structural correctives. There shouldn't be any legislation. There shouldn't be any policies. There should, you know, it's a, it's a very, um, it's, it's, it's a very self-serving view. Um, I think that so frequently comes where it's about the advancement of an individual and a limited number of like-minded people, Ted Cruz and his followers, Mike Pence and his followers, a finite number of people. And I think that the more, collective notion that we got from Barack Obama that we get from many politicians on the left is I want to bring an us along and and that us can it I would say in Obama's vision was huge right yes. he he didn't we often forget he was raised by a white mother and two yes. white grandparents working class people his dream um his dream incorporated that side of his family beautifully, but I don't know that his distant cousins, as it were, understood that when he passed the Affordable Care Act, it wasn't just for um, uh, people of color. The afford the beneficiaries of the Affordable Care Act were always the people were the people who became Trump's base, but yes. they don't get that. Patricia, I had thoroughly enjoyed talking with you. I I. I hope you understand that I could go on and chat to you for, for at least another hour or more. Um, it's such a good book and it's, it's, it's an important book. I think it's something which I, I, as I said, right at the top, it should be in schools. And, and I think anybody that just wants to sort of have a little understanding about how we treat one another, this, this book is so good. Oh, I just should add this before we, before we leave that on your, on your website, you say Patricia A. Turner is a folklorist who documents and analyzes the stories that define the African-American experience. I love that. I think that's so incredibly important. Patricia, I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. The book is, the book is called Trash Talk, Anti-Obama, Law and Race in the 21st Century. Thank you so very much for joining us at Life Elsewhere. Oh, thank you. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And if there's ever an opportunity for us to chat again, I would welcome that. I would love that because I think, you know, I think you and I could go off on many tangents and talk about uh, lots of different things sort of based around what we're talking about now. But I I would love that. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much, Patricia. Bye bye now. Bye bye. The link to Patricia Turner's book, Trash Talk, is up at lifeelsewhere.co. Go there to learn all about the shows we present. Still to come, highly regarded caricaturist Steve Brodner and his faithful dog Jazz will join me to share a political cartoonist take on Barack Obama and the 45th president. Right after this. Listening to the best show on radio about art, media, and culture. Life Elsewhere with Norman B. I'm so pleased to welcome back to the program a gentleman we always enjoy talking to. His name is Steve Brodner. He is a renowned caricaturist. He's also a teacher. He's he's a man that commentates on all kinds of things, particularly politics and what's going on in the world. Steve Brodner, welcome back to Life Elsewhere. I see you've got your friend. Your what's the name of your dog? I see there. This is, this is Jazz. Jazz. Well, Jazz, Jazz welcome. Is responsible for uh, not only being a dog, but also being an illustrator's dog, which means it's a, a lot more responsible. It's sort of like being the firehouse dog. Like it, uh, he hangs out and then uh, participates in all the trouble I get into. Right now yeah. in New York, it's about five o'clock, and he knows what time it is. He knows it's yes, time. he oh, knows. Yeah, got it. Have, that's what this is. This is all right now. Like, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> hey, 
anyway, well, us- my studio. I'm I'm on the Upper West Side of New York, and yeah. I do. I'm a freelance guy. Work for the Nation, uh, Washington Post, L.A. Times, uh, New York Times, uh, Columbia Journalism Review, uh, and I've been doing that for a few years now. Yes, yes, and, indeed. Uh, and so. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you, Norman. Thank you. For- Thank you, Steve. What I want to talk about is in the program, um, we have been talking to Patricia Turner, who's written a fabulous book called Trash Talk. And it's all about how the right painted Obama. I want to go back in time, Steve. If you remember, we did a program called Could a Caricature Become President? And this, I believe, was in 2015. Now, we kind of, and as I see you smiling, we we kind of joked, we kind of smiled, and you said some wonderful... You took it seriously. Who took it seriously? What's happened to this country? Right, exactly. Unbelievable. Yes. So here we are. So we know who became president. The caricature did. But at the time, Obama was being trashed, and it didn't start just then. It started way back when. Uh, But I'd like to get your caricaturist take on the the trashing of Obama, because he was trashed not only in words, but in in, in pictures as well. Can you just go back a little bit and just give us your take on that? I never trashed Obama. I always had a lot of respect for him. Um, And I don't think I trash anybody who doesn't deserve it. <laughs> yes. Uh, but some people are trash to start with, and you, you've got to just, there's nothing to sneeze at. And you've got to uh, just face facts. And, and uh, caricatures are, uh, have no power unless they tell the truth. Yes. So there are a lot of caricaturists in the world, not a lot, who uh, feel that they can do their job if they just make stuff up. But those people are part of the right-wing ecosystem in which making stuff up is the only way to go. That's the only way to survive. Because if you had to deal in facts, you wouldn't have much to say. So you've got to create, it's a very, it's fiction. These are all fiction writers and they're all working on uh, a narrative that they're desperately trying to um, find from each other. And they're test marketing different kinds of narratives. Yes. Like the guy who came up with critical race theory. There is no critical race theory being taught in public schools. There is, there's only a college course that has that interesting name. It sounds conspiratorial. It sounds like a name that has a whole bunch of people you know, conspiring and secretly gathering together uh, to uh, take you over or to thwart your culture. So these are culture wars things. Obama is fits right into that entire uh, mechanism. Uh, imagine a black man running for president. Forget about being president. It was more absurd to the racists in this country that Obama would be president than it was for sane, educated people, particularly those who have been following Donald Trump's career <laughs> for yes. 40 years, to think that this, this low life could become president of the United States. I, I'm remembering Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson said, I believe to Bill Moyers, and this is, this is a real quote. You can look this up. Uh, he said, uh, if you could, this is after a lifetime in Texas politics. If you can convince the lowest white man that he is better than the best black man, he will not only allow you to pick his pocket all day, he will open his pockets and spread all his money out for you. Because this is a narrative that people have uh, cherished. Um, Things that come back to them from their moms and pops from uh, the 19th century, when they needed narratives to uh, 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 comfort themselves after having lost civil war. Yes. And having then uh, had all kinds of, having 
all kinds of laws changed, which they then uh, worked very effectively to change back. And that's why we've lost the civil rights, the Voting Rights Act in this country. And that's why we have lost the Supreme Court in this country. And that's why uh, Fox News is very successful. There hasn't been one minute of American history, if you just look at it, look at all the headlines of every month in American history, there hasn't been one day that has not been colored by race. Yes. So now a black man be actually becomes president. It drives them crazy. And the, and the reason that Donald Trump has traction in the very, very beginning, when you and I talked in, I guess it was before the election, 2015. Yes. The reason Trump became something other than a real estate swindler joke in New York, failed casino operator, a uh, philandering joke, was because he said, uh, I don't think Obama was born in this country. And the minute he said that, um, that part of America that had been waiting for something, some, some little story, some, you know, something like the lost cause after Civil War, they lit up. They, the country lit up like, uh, like a Christmas tree. And Trump at that moment realized, look at all the rubes I have. Look at all the suckers I have. All I have to do is say these few magic words, like now critical race theory or whatever. Every week they're working to, mm. to uh, test market, uh, focus group, a new a bunch of words like this that makes the Christmas tree light up. And that's what Fox is every night. They, they track their ratings minute to minute on Fox. Yes. I don't know if you know that. Yes. Like, oh, they get the dailies or they get the weeklies. It's, they can see when it goes up and when it goes up. Oh, this guest came on and went through the roof. And this one came on. We get rid of her. We don't bring her back anymore because look what happened. People turned the channel, changed, changed the channel. So uh, it's constantly gauging the Christmas tree, right? Because that actually translate it translates into bucks trump is in it for the bucks tucker carlson all the murdochs they're in it for the bucks and they know their suckers when they find them and it's a search for suckers who are going to they could vote for herschel walker for senator come on the man is like he needs he, needs, he really needs like a, a head brace the man has bashed his head too much and he can't even put sentences together that make any sense. And same thing with Dr. The Dr. Oz and uh, Vance and the whole clown car because you have the suckers. They found their suckers and people who, and, I, and I'm sure in families, the people listening to me, people that you know, aunts, uncles, nice people who never paid attention to politics. They never voted. They never read a newspaper. They're like, suddenly they're an expert on COVID-19. Suddenly they're an expert on critical race theory. They know all that because I do my own research, you know. Just looking back, Steve, and thank you for that. It's a, a great summation. Just looking back through the eyes of a caricaturist, it's almost an impossible to believe that we have forgotten in a lot of respects just how cruel the trashing of Obama was. Just like to get your take on just the, the, the cruelty aspects. The cruelty the is cruel the point. Somebody wrote this book. I can't remember the author. The cruelty is the point. There, there was so much politesse in politics for so many years. And then you had this group that would have been marginalized if Trump hadn't won, but he won. So into yes. the White House comes marching Bannon and Stone and Flynn. Yes. And sadism is their uh, meat. That's what their, their stock and trade. And they have all those crazies who wanted to kill Mike Pence, <laughs> their own <laughs> vice president, on January 6th, marching into the White House on a carnival of crime, a carnival of death. They had weapons that Trump wanted them to have. 
Here's the crazy thing, Steve, is that you and I right now, as we have before, this is a very serious topic, yet at the same time, because it is so ludicrous in in so many respects, we can't doing what we're doing right now is smiling and laughing at the same time. That is the part of this which is just absolutely bizarre. And that's also the part of it that makes this hard to... uh, deal with as it should be because i'm as i said i'm from new york yeah Uh, i grew i grew up trump is what seven years older than i am yeah eight years older than i am i'm practically of his generation i'm from brooklyn he's from queens i i've been aware of him since the 70s i know what a clown he is everybody here knows what a joke donald trump is and it's like Remember the Woody Allen movie where Albert Shanker gets the atomic bomb? This was Sleeper. Yes. Right? yes. And it's a yeah. big joke. What happened? He comes back in the future. What happened uh, to uh, the world? Well, everything went bad the minute Albert Shanker got the atomic bomb. He <laughs> yeah. was a, a, like a New York character, like Bella Abzug or Ed Koch, uh, a comic, almost a comic book character who was head of, a, of the teachers' union. And he, yeah. they led a lot of strikes during the time of Lindsay, this is, goes too far back for you and everyone else, but Trump is in that box. Trump is from that group of crazy New York characters that nobody took, everybody like, saw him at Studio 54, getting coked up with all these women and being in the news as this flashy, rich, spoiled, bratty idiot. And that's all he was. And, and then for the next 30 years, look what he failed at. He failed at this. He failed at that. He took well, built a massive casino in Atlantic City, which he went allowed to go to pot. And he took a huge loss on it and got all these lawyers. And he escaped swindling people for 40 years. And this is the greatest swindle of his life. This was now his masterpiece of, of grift and, and that. There's, he's what his great research was of his life is to is to identify how many idiots there are in America. You know, there, there, there was a, a movie, a, a Broadway play called 50 Million Frenchmen uh, many years ago. There maybe one day will be a, a movie about Trump called 50 Million Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Where, whilst we've gone off on the tangent of Trump specifically, I have to ask you this in the very few minutes we have left. Is Trump going to be convicted from your perspective? I think he would be convicted uh, by uh, 530, which is in five minutes, uh, (laughs) if he were not Trump. And I think it's very dangerous if you indict him and you don't have an airtight case. Yes. Trump's misfortune that Merrick Garland has a 100% conviction rate of everything he's prosecuted. Yes. And that's because he knows how to button it down. He yes. knows that you don't go shooting your mouth off. You just quietly gather everything. So we all saw the redacted affidavit. Uh, 90% of it was blocked out. What was that? You know, we everyone professes to know things now. We know a little bit, but look at all that other stuff that they thought they were going to get. And then look at all the stuff that they got. We don't know nothing about oh, Right. You're absolutely right. We will find out. Eric Garland knows. Yeah. This is just speculation, okay? Biden is going to make a speech about saving democracy. I think tomorrow or the yes, next. Yes, that's time. right. Yes. And I think there's a reason he's making it. I think he knows also. He's got an idea of how deep Trump is in and how unavoidable the indictment is going to be. And then he knows that when that happens, the 70% of America that doesn't want to burn it down, that doesn't care, that wants to get rid of Trump, including a lot of Republicans, they need to be kind of 
on notice that this is coming. Yes. And I think that's what, what he's actually saying. He's saying, something's coming here. It's going to be very rough for America. And everybody hang together because we'll make it. But there are a lot of crazies with guns. And, and yeah, I do think he's going to be indicted. And I think if Garland indicts, he'll have the goods. I believe they have a lot. Such a good point, and so well said, of course. A little bird tells me that you, Mr. Brodner, have a book in the making. Since the beginning of the pandemic, now for over two years, two and a half years, I've been doing a daily illustration called The Greater Quiet. And this is, you can find this on Substack. You can find it at The Nation magazine. They run it every week. And it's just a daily selection of people who have either been victimized by first the pandemic, then racial justice issues, and now uh, I'm, I'm telling abortion stories, and people who are actually guilty of hurting others. And so Fantagraphics Books has compiled about 480 of them into a huge, I don't have a copy here. Uh, it's not out yet. It's going to come out September 13th. Okay. Uh, and then um, everyone will be able to see it, but it's it's a fat thing. It's a, like seven inches high, seven inches wide, maybe seven inches fat. But it's it's two years worth of daily illustration based on what was happening at that time. Um, well, I am looking forward to seeing the book, going through it myself. It's called Living and Dying in America, a daily chronicle 2020 to 2022. And it goes from the from the, the pandemic in the darkest days of the pandemic started in March of 2020 when we all, you know, all the lockdowns came. Yeah. And it went, it's still going. I'm doing one every day, but the book stops in January of 20 of this year. So I covered the election and the insurrection and all of the stuff that, uh, you know, I'm right about some things, I'm wrong about some things, but it's all there. And, uh, I hope it means something to people. It meant a lot to me. Well, I think it's going to be exciting to get you back on the air and talk about the book in detail. In the meantime, you take that anxious pet of yours off the wherever you, wherever you go for a cocktail with him or, 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 or somewhere. He actually and... does take Prozac, Norman. Ah, yes. Prozac. Well, you can, see, you can see he's he's chilling now. He's, he's chilling now. Okay. Well, but you take him off that, wherever you go. Yeah. And we will talk to you very soon. I wish you well, my friend. It is always an absolute delight talking to you. Same here, Norman. Hang in there. A big round of applause, please, for my guests, Patricia Turner and Steve Brodner. And a very large thank you to you for listening. My email address comes up in the closing credits, so jot it down, won't you, and send me your questions, queries, or comments. Till next time, be well, be safe, and try it. You know you like it. Be nice. Bye-bye. You have been listening to Life Elsewhere, created and hosted by Norman B. Life Elsewhere is written and produced by Norman B. Guest booking and additional research by Stephanie Lane. Behind the scenes assistance by James Van, Bruce Goodman, and Allison Klein. We love to hear what you think about Life Elsewhere. Send your questions, queries, and comments to info at lifeelsewhere.com. Dot co. That's C-O. Mm-hmm.